now we have the very special honor of having Mr. Suraj Vaidya to give a keynote address this morning. Uh, Mr. Suraj Vaidya is the president of the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation, Chamber of uh, Commerce and Industry. My apologies. This keynote address is also wonderfully sponsored by the Frederick Nauman Foundation for Liberty. To moderate, I'd now like to call Dr. Ronald Maynardis, head of the Frederick Nauman Foundation's regional office in South Asia. Dr. Maynardis has also previously served as the head of the regional office for the Middle East and North Africa. He is a political commentator and often writes about developments in the region. Dr. Maynardis, the stage is yours. And tweets at, at Maynardis. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really pleased to be back, and I'm, I'm very pleased also and honored to introduce uh, who is a partner and also a good friend. Uh, he's a dynamic and visionary leader uh, from a country called Nepal, uh, which many of you know because in 2015 uh, we had a very successful Asia Liberty Forum in Kathmandu. Uh, Suraj uh, has a sound and authoritative perspective on his own country and uh, his region, uh, otherwise he would not be chairing uh, the SAC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and also in Asia and the world at large. Uh, I think therefore he's a very suitable uh, resource person for the speech we will hear in a little while from now. Operating very successful uh, on the interface of politics and the economy, Mr. Soroj Vedya is convinced, and uh, I'm sure that uh, this will come over, that the two uh, go together hand in hand. And this uh, is reflected also in his resume. Uh, economy should speak louder than politics, is a quote from his resume. A graduate of MBA from George Mason University, Suraj Vedya is uh, a very successful entrepreneur uh, dealing with agriculture, construction, education and trading. Uh, importantly, and that's what brings us together, uh, he is the president of the SARC Chamber of Commerce and Industry. This will be a focus of his talk today. Uh, he is also, and this is the South Asian component, uh, a member, a board member of the School of Management, Asia Institute of Technology in Thailand, and uh, uh, the honorary Consul General of the Philippines. Um, and uh, very importantly, of the many, many positions he holds, uh, he's the chairman of the Sam Ritty Foundation, we all know the Sam Ritty Foundation. If not, it's time we get to know it, a very successful uh, organization, NGO from uh, Nepal. And uh, I was just informed uh, by direct message on Twitter that he's actually the first alumnus of our International Academy for Leadership in Germany. So for us as the Naumann Foundation, he's a good old friend. And for all of us, he's a very, very valuable resource person. So please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Mr. Suraj Vedya. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, a very impressive morning. I mean, I was amazed at the speakers and it's not the stories that they were telling us. It was the experience they were living it. And I think I'm inspired. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to say a few words today. I was kind of nervous initially because when they said the session was for an hour, normally I don't do this. I mean, I speak for about five minutes and walk off the stage and then you know, let whoever take over. So I'm privileged and I want to thank everybody here for being here with us. Um, I need to talk about South Asia today, and probably I'll just run this very quickly. An hour is a hell of a long time. I'll try and keep mine short. A quick introduction of South Asia, probably 15 minutes. What I always prefer is to speak heart to heart, so probably you may have a lot more questions than me, me speaking too much. So we'll try and work on the timing as best as we can. You know, if you look at South Asia, probably 5,000 years ago, we were just one great nation. 
the British Empire ruled South Asia from 1858 to 1947, except Nepal. Sri Lanka then became independent in 1937. India, Pakistan, partition brought about two countries in 1947. Bangladesh became a country in 1971. And then in 1985, all of us said we need to form a club again. So then we formed the South Asia Regional Corporation that we have today. So SARC is basically countries of, of eight, starting from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. So these are the countries that are involved in South Asia. Like many regional blocs, we tend to think we've done some amazing things. And we've moved forward. We've had 18 summits in the last 30 years where heads of governments have come and told the people of the vision that they have to get South Asia back to prosperity. But I think beside all these achievements that you see here, we haven't had a major war or conflict in the region after this regional bloc was formed. It was a platform where people would discuss ideas, disagree on issues, try and find ways to move forward. And that's what SARC is all about. Roger, who is a, a venture capitalist who now lives in Singapore, you know what he said was, if you were smart in 1807, you probably moved to London. If you were smart in 1907, you probably moved to New York. And if you were smart in 27, 2007, you'd move to Asia. Many of us believe this millennium belongs to Asia, and therefore all of us in Asia need to celebrate that. The recent World Bank study, which comes under South Asia focus, states that econom economic growth is forecasted to gradually increase to about 7.5 percent by 2019, which is impressive. And I think that's the direction that we're moving on. And some of these figures actually tell you why it's possible. 1.8 billion people in South Asia, 30 of, 30 percent of them young, 26.6 trillion, fifth largest in the world, GDP increasing, one of the fastest growth in the world. And then we only have about 5% inter-trade, which means the potentials to improve that is tremendous. So I don't look at 5% as a negative, but I look at it as a positive indicator of how or what holds for South Asia. I believe that South Asia, we've got tremendous potential. If you were to sort of break that down, Afghanistan, which is coming out of its conflict, has tremendous options in its mining. There was a study recently done which said $3 trillion worth of mines and minerals exist in Afghanistan itself. Bangladesh today is the second largest world production house for garments. Bhutan, Nepal has tremendous potential in hydropower development. India, with Make in India, is looking for a tremendous amount of investment that helps it to move forward. Pakistan, Sri Lanka, investing big amount of money in its infrastructure. Maldives, which is a paradise by itself, is attracting large number of tourism. So therefore, I think South Asia has tremendous potential as it moves forward. Yet, South Asia is one of the regions that's disconnected. We have huge amount of problems. Cost of doing business in South Asia is higher than most regional blocks. Three of the members out of eight are landlocked countries, which makes it extremely difficult to do business. And therefore, nowhere in the world are collective efforts more urgent than South Asia. Nowhere else is it so modest, no matter how big or how small, the challenges we face is the same. Today, less than 5% of the region's global trade takes place between us. So therefore, there is 
there is a fundamental problem in South Asia in spite of the growth, in spite of the potentials that we have. I take this as a very important reason why South Asia hasn't moved forward. SARC's economy takes a backseat to politics and security. SARC was founded some 30 years ago. SARC chamber is about 25 years now. It was only after five years where the heads of government met repeatedly for five years did they decide that economy and the private sector needed to come on board because what they promised to the people wasn't being achieved. Big declaration used to be made in every summit how we would increase the prosperity for the people, but never happened. So probably what happened was the security concerns that governments normally show because fear factor is the best way to get power in place. Colonel Powell said once, the root cause to terrorism does come from situation where there is poverty, where there's ignorance, where people have no hope in their lives. Amongst the poor people living on less than $1.25 per day, who have half that power electricity in their homes, Sub-Saharan uh, Sub Africa and South Asia accounts for about 80% of global poor and 81% of all child death in the world. That is where South Asia is. Now, what is holding us back is in spite of all the potentials we have, we must not and cannot make the region's prosperity a hostage to a handful of in inhuman terrorists that we call, that exists in South Asia. Terrorism is something all governments in South Asia repeatedly mention and hinders the prosperity and the economic growth of this region. I would speak a little more on that as we move forward. I'm sure you all know this quote, when goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. In South Asia, the movement of people is extremely difficult. I was impressed when I came into Indonesia. I gave my passport, I didn't have to pay a visa fee, they stamped on it and I moved on. In our part of the world, when an Indian goes to Pakistan, one, to get the visa itself is a huge hurdle, tremendous amount of problem, or when a Pakistani goes to India, vice versa. That's not it, it doesn't stop there. For the business community and people at large of these two countries, when they travel to each other's country, they need to report to the police station every day. It's unheard of. And yet we call ourselves a fraternity, a united group for people of South Asia. When you restrict movement of people, goods don't follow. And therefore, the biggest challenge we have in South Asia really is, how do we get this mindset off us that talks about security in so many ways? We need to learn from the region. ASEAN, you have your problems. NAFTA, you've got your problems. European Union, you have your problems. But there are many good things that we can learn from each other that we move forward with. For SARC, it's extremely important to see how ASEAN is moved forward, the interdependence of trade between each other, 25%. The ASEAN economic community offers opportunities in forms of huge single market of $2.6 trillion and a market to 622 million people. This is amazing. So I think these are lessons that we learn in spite of all the things that we have in South Asia. I mentioned that a little while ago. Oops. These are the eight countries that exist. Afghanistan has tremendous potential. And like I said, I'm an optimist. I like to think things are better, will get better. Most of these countries have internal problems, but Afghanistan is moving forward in spite of, you know, I was there recently, I was there for my, for my executive meeting, and the securities that I had to go through was really a, a, a challenging task by itself. And um, I couldn't move out of my hotel. 
the first thing they did was when they took me into this hotel was to show us the holding room, which meant if there was a terrorist attack, we were all told how we need to get into a bunker. I and mean, that's how you start your journey in Afghanistan. It's, it's frightening. I mean, it's frightening. It's really frightening. It, it wakes you up and says, how, you know, am I, am I in the right place? So, yeah, I mean, we do have problems here. But having said that, I look at the opportunities of it. I am an optimist. I'm a business person. I feel people will eventually find the right way to move forward. An economy will bring in the, the, the prosperity that we need in South Asia. Uh, again, you know, one-fifth population in South Asia is under the age of 15 to uh, 24, the largest of the world. That is what South Asia has, the youth. My son, when he came back, he studies in the States, and he came back and he said, Dad, I want to invest in bitcoins. I said, what is bitcoins? <laughs> he said, Dad, it's a currency that you really don't need to worry about. You know, we just sort of buy them on the net. I didn't even understand that. This is where the young generation, the way they look, they perceive the world is so different from mindset of people like myself in South Asia who are still worried about the borders, the securities, and what have you. The youth of South Asia looks at South Asia in a very different manner. They don't need to cross the border. They click onto their smartphones. They want to find out what's happening in the rest of the world. They have information. So therefore, these are people who think differently. And that's the hope that South Asia has, is these are the youth who are educated, who will change, who will change the mindset of the people of South Asia. That's the biggest hope we have. We've got a huge middle, in, uh, middle class that's growing up, 1.8 billion people, over a quarter of the world's population, and therefore I just feel that we've got tremendous potential of moving forward. And South Asia, in our discussion, as we move forward, probably we could exchange more ideas as we see what needs to be done. You know, the problem is, again, connectivity, infrastructure, which is the poorest. If I wanted to take my goods from Nepal to Bangladesh, I need to insure my car with the Indian Embassy in Nepal to the value of the vehicle that's worth. And then when I drive across, I need to cross over so many security points, checkpoints, makes it almost impossible to get my goods across. That's not bad enough. You probably, if you drove in some of these roads, you think there was a war that took place a couple of months ago because the potholes are bigger than the size of the car itself. <laughs> you know, and that, 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 these are problems that we have. So the infrastructure is terrible, and we need to improve that. And I would say, unless we invest well and well in infrastructure, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult for South Asia to move forward. And that is what we as private sector believe, is South Asia, the government needs to invest a lot more money in, 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 in infrastructures, the money is not coming from the government itself. So therefore, there's going to be a lot of involvement of the private-public partnership that we talk about, where the private sector will have to come in and invest a large part of that. So these are things that we need to look at. Uh, we need to look at the barriers. I mean, you know, the, these artificially created barriers. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's incredibly tough to do business in South Asia. I need to be quite uh, honest and open on that. The, the, the transaction costs are extremely high. Uh, the time spent on the borders, uh, uh, it's, 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 unless you do business, you really won't even understand where I'm coming in from. Because you normally take a good, like let's say if I was to export my tea, which I do, uh, from Nepal to India, uh, the truck would probably stay in the border for about two days because they need to take out samples from the boxes that's been packed and sent to a testing uh, lab and then get approval that is health-wise, it's okay, and then the goods finally move. And that's how we're still living in. So, yeah, I mean, you know, as a private sector, it's extremely challenging. But again, when I say all this, I always take it with a hope that the difference is going to come from the people. I heard some of you speak this morning, and the change is not going to come from the governments. The governments will do what they need to do. And I liked what somebody said this morning, the change has to come from the people. And I think South Asia with 1.8 billion people, that's a lot of people. So probably we need to get the people moving forward a little bit. And you know, these are some things that we're working on, is um, the motor vehicle agreement, the transit protocols, which are again, like I said, these are some of the problems that we have, the visa regimes that is extremely difficult to, to work on. And, um, 
these are, these are the ways that we, f we need to move forward on. As a chamber of commerce and industry, we meet every quarter. I mean, let me tell you a story. Uh, you know, when India and Pakistan were at the heights of, of, of uh, uh, a very difficult situation where the summit was called up because of terrorism, there were skirmishes that took place along the borders, people were killed. What we decided as a chamber was we'll hold the meeting in two countries at the two borders of the two countries. Uh, we were advised against it by well-wishers, including our families. But I must say, uh, our friends from India and Pakistan were extremely brave. We went to a city called Amritsar. We started our meeting up there. And then we walked across the Wagga border, which actually you need to walk across that border. And we went into Pakistan. We went to Lahore. What surprised us was the people on both sides were condemning what was happening. And yet, what we read, what we saw, and what we thought would happen was not even there. My Indian friends were welcomed in Pakistan with garlands and flowers. My friends from Pakistan were you know, brought into India with all the sweets and what have you, probably put on a few cages when they went back. Yeah, I mean, you know, things were good. But this is what private sector does, is we need to move beyond this. We need to break these barriers, artificial barriers down, which governments create time to time for whatever reasons that they see fit. And again, it's, it's challenging because you're normally advised to go against things like this. Something that I think is time for South Asia is what you have here. Uh, I've been to the meeting that started off in Kathmandu. I've seen the kind of people that come in for the discussion. And I think what we really need is people who would come together and try and understand each other a little bit more. And we need to create this think tank uh, you know, to, to somehow reduce this barrier. The so-called experts, when you, when, when you watch the televisions in, in our part of the world, the so-called experts always look at things as the negatives of things. And I think what we need is a people's forum from different walks of life who feel that there's much more beyond politics and politics alone. The liberty, the freedom, the movement of people, the, the options of doing business to, to, to get the people who are who, who least have it, to give them a hope that they can move forward. So I think this is something that we'd like to see coming out of discussions like this. How many of you watch the Indian television or the Pakistani television? You know, when you watch them, really, you think war is on. I mean, we are so negative about everything. And it's time, and I think media plays an extremely, extremely important role, and somehow we need to bring these people together to say, we understand this problem. Show me one place where the problem doesn't exist. In my family, we're two brothers, myself and my younger brother. We hardly agree on anything. But then we talk. So probably I think, you know, we've got problems, but we need to look at it as half full instead of half empty all the time. We focus so much on the half empty that we forget the beauty and the things that we have. Something I started in the South Chamber was the women movement. You know, in, in, in South Asia, we're always talking about empowering women. Probably it's true, we need to look at it. But it's really the women empowering South Asia which is much more important. We've forgotten the Gandhis, the Bhuttos, the Hasinas that we've created in our countries who lead our countries. These are women of tremendous potential. If you look at some of the biggest business in India, Pakistan, Nepal, it's the women who are in the driving seat. And therefore, we're always looking at empowering women, and we forget these wonderful stories of women that are empowering us already. We need to change our mindset. We need to look at things that are there already and build on that. But if we go on looking at the negatives, we're never going to move forward. So I think the biggest challenge in South Asia really today stands in the communication and getting things moving forward. So, South Chamber, we work on this. We try to bring communication as a strategy to move forward. And we hope the mindset that we are focused on will change and truly bring the prosperity we need. You know, when you say 80% of the world's poor live in our part of the world, my country, Nepal, 
26% of the GDP that comes into our country in foreign exchange comes in through migrant workers, which is amazingly good. But what we forget, that every day there's a body bag that comes back because the condition of working in some of these countries are extremely difficult. For me, remittance is good, but the loss of one life is too many. And therefore, what we're focusing on is investment in, uh, in South Asia. From March 16th to 18th, we have a South Asia Business Leaders Conclave where we bring governments together, we bring thinkers together, we bring private sector together, and we bring people together to discuss and hopefully break the walls that we built for ourselves. Many countries have done it. Germany, the walls have come down. It's encouraging that in the Winter Olympics, the North and South are marching together. What happens? These are indications of moving forward. And I think in South Asia, where we proclaim that we have the largest democracy, it's time for us to act. I look forward on your questions and probably we'll take it on from there. Thank you. So oh, thank you so much. I will now wait till there is some reordering here and then we will sit in the ease of our armchairs and uh, we are thinking of uh, that uh, I ask some questions first for the first 15 minutes and then we open up to you uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, and uh, in the meantime there is some technical rearrangement done. Uh, uh, maybe I can use the time to say that the SARC Chamber of Commerce and Industry is an old-time partner of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. The Naumann Foundation believes in free trade and we believe that it makes sense to support entrepreneurs who are crossing the borders. And we are proudly associated uh, with SARC Chambers of Commerce and Industry and also with our dear friend and fellow Sovac Vedia. Thank you, sir. Derek. Thank you very much. Uh, I can even offer you a drink. Oh, that's nice. Thank uh, you. Great. <laughs> so, there's only one drink here, so... Okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. So I, uh, we have about 25 minutes. So I thought of uh, using this time for some 10, 15 minutes in a dialogue and then opening up. Uh, and I would like to organize some of our discussion uh, to talk first about uh, SCCI, uh, your role uh, as a chairperson uh, of this organization. Then I would like to spread out a little uh, because we are in Asia and I'd like to speak about the situation of Asia and uh, the situation here also in the global context. And then maybe we can still talk a little about more political things um, like uh, the role of civil society which you mentioned. Uh, the private sector. You are representing the private sector in a very prominent manner. You are, you are telling us that it's not so good in South Asia with the integration. It's the least integrated region. Uh, so what do you see concretely? What is the role? What can the private sector do? And please be as concrete and uh, uh, as practical as possible. I think what we've done in the, in the past uh, years is to try and enhance the people to coming together. Uh, in terms of investments, uh, we have a book that we launch, which is on a regular, a yearly basis, which has about 20 projects each from every country. And we have road shows to bring in investments. And again, I go back to investment, is because every country in South Asia is thinking of creating jobs, is thinking of utilizing its natural resources to enhance the economy in every country. So that's something that we do uh, on, on, on a regular basis. Um, by which we showcase South Asia within ourselves and beyond that we have these potentials which are waiting to be... So you're talking of potential yeah. all the time. Are there practical results to this? Do these activities you are doing actually lead to an in, in Indian investing in Pakistan or Bangladesh investing in Nepal? The laws in South Asia at the moment are still difficult. Uh, the investment that is happening within uh, South Asia has increased quite a bit. Uh, I can't say the ratio is the same for all countries. There's a lot of investment from the region in, in areas of infrastructure in Hyderabad, from India going into Bhutan, uh, from Nepal going into Sri Lanka at the moment. 
uh, there's a lot of trading companies that have been established. But because the laws are so rigid, uh, what is also strange is we find ourselves that we set up companies in Singapore or Hong Kong, which makes it a lot easier for us to set a company up there and do business in South Asia. I mean, that's the reality. We need to find ways, and that's how we at times you know, break these barriers down. We are here in Indonesia, a, a huge country uh, which uh, we all know is playing a very uh, influential role in the ASEAN, which is also a regional outfit. Um, one often says, if one often sees in the media in South Asia that, uh, that the South Asians can learn from ASEAN. Uh, what would be your takeaway if you, if you look at things here in this part of the world and what would you take home to, to the SARC Chamber of Commerce and Industry and SARC in general? I think we all have our issues in, in the world, but I think what I take back from, uh, from, from here, really, is the tremendous economic growth where the people are involved in its own. I mean, they, they seem to be creating these jobs. Uh, the policy seems to be a lot more workable. Uh, the movement of people is a lot easier for within the people in ASEAN, which means trade and investment follows very easily. So I think that's the barrier that is critically important that we take back. Uh, I will get now uh, uh, maybe a little more controversial. Uh, there is at se in some uh, countries of this uh, part of the world a certain anxiety uh, uh, regarding the growing influence of China. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, SCCI, the SARC Chambers of Commerce and Industry, uh, is proactively engaging uh, with China. How would you uh, judge the role of China uh, as a, a, a co cooperative partner in, in your part of the world and uh, beyond that? The reality is I think whole of South Asia is looking for investment. I mean, in India, you've got this make in India, you've got everybody looking for investments. Uh, what we've seen in the past, and not surprisingly, because these are figures that show for itself, the biggest investor in Afghanistan is the Chinese. The largest investor in Sri Lanka is the Chinese. The biggest trading partner in Bangladesh is the Chinese. The largest investor in Nepal now has become Chinese. So therefore, you're seeing a lot of Chinese influence coming in through the economic part of it. Now, uh, I think, whether we like it or not, the Chinese are looking at investing beyond their own countries. And therefore, we as South Asians need to take advantage of the, you know, the, 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 the environment that we have. And uh, you do see more and more Chinese coming into South Asia. Uh, there's also a question, in, like in Sri Lanka and Maldives, the debt trap uh, that's, uh, that we all hear of. And I think we, as people of South Asia, need to be careful on how far we need to go in terms of bringing this easy money, so we call, uh, in our countries. Is it really easy money? Isn't it not attached to some strings which are, at the moment, maybe not visible? Probably there is. I mean, you know, you hear a lot of things happening around the world. But let's look at it this way. Sri Lanka. Uh, wants to be the next Singapore. And to do that, they need a lot of investment. Uh, Sri Lanka has just come out of a major conflict of its own. Uh, one country that came up very quick and said, we will build a port for you, the port city, and they've done it. Now, what are the choices and options available? And as a business, as a business, I need to make sure what I invest in I have a way to return that fund or whatever uh, the fund may be. The cost of finance coming from China is incredibly low with a lot of less strings attached when it comes to doing business. You know, when somebody says, I'll give you the fund at about 3.5% over a period of 30 years, you don't normally say no, right? And having said that, I think what bounds us in South Asia to look at the Chinese fund is uh, business to business, it's a lot easier to work because they, 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 they come and they go. Uh, but when you look at it from a more bigger picture, strategic location, when you look at the, the potentials of, of, of China increasing its economic uh, control, uh, which would affect the political situation, is something that we're all aware of. And I think uh, we also understand how far this needs to go, really. Could you agree to a formulation that the advance of the Chinese is also a result of the retreat of, of a Western powers? Or is that uh, taking it too far? I would think so, because, I mean, look, the World Bank, the Asian Development Banks are there to help countries with its infrastructure and uh, what have you. But really, to get that kind of money from World Bank or ADB takes years to clear the documents, which every, from year to year, makes it more expensive. Uh, so it's really, again, like I said, access to fund, 
getting quicker decisions made. Uh, and I tend to agree with you to a large part. A lot of Western countries are withdrawing to itself. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is something that China is today one of the largest outbound investors. And there's nothing you can do about it. They are investing all over the world. And if South Asia needs to keep the pace of its development, we need to find sources where the funds are coming out from. Uh, from China now to, to Nepal, uh, you are uh, very active there as a business person and investor, but also as the chairperson of Sam Riddhi Foundation. Uh, can, can you please explain to the audience here uh, what motivates you and how you see the role of such a think tank and advocacy group uh, for a country like, uh, like Nepal? You know, when Robin is here, I see him here somewhere, and Arpita was in Kathmandu. And, uh, you know, when you think of these experts in countries like ours, you normally come with the standard names of these are the experts that you have. And the discussion I had with Robin and Arpita was we need to have the young people decide their future. It's not my generation that decides what the future of Nepal should be. It's the young people who should be involved in deciding what their future needs to be. And Samridhi is a foundation of young people who understand and know what their needs are in the next 20 years, because they're the one who are going to be living that, found, uh, that, that period. So I think with that concept, we move forward. And I think Samridhi has done a fantastic job. They always have a lot of interns coming in who work with them, understand the country's policy, work with the young politicians, especially because Nepal is in transition of democracy. They work with the young politicians in, 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 in uh, making them understand the values of, of free society, of having more open economy. So I think that's what somebody does. And that really inspires me in saying, this is the right way to go, is let the future be decided by the young people. It inspires you, or does it also inspire the generation of young people and the politicians? I mean, Nepal is, is, is now not as the beacon of market economy and freedom. Uh, at least this is the picture I have. I mean, the young people of Nepal are amazing. Let me just tell you a story. You know, you, you, you've heard of the earthquake that we had two years ago. You know who were the first to mobilize? It's not the army, not the police, not the government. The young people came out voluntarily, picked up whatever they could, got donation from house to house, and they were the first ones to reach where desperately people were seeking help. So I think that's, that's the young Nepal that we're looking at. Is, uh, it's, it's amazing how the entire system works if you let the young people take the lead. One final question from my side, uh, Suraj. Uh, you made a very strong point in favor of uh, civil society playing a role, and your personal activism is, uh, is a proof of this. Now, if you look around also in this part of the world, the state of democracy and civil society has been better at times. Uh, there's talk of uh, shrinking spaces, some talk of uh, even closing spaces uh, for some organizations who are, who are working in the field. What is your take on this? I think the more we share, the more we learn from each other. I think, you know, uh, again, I was listening to some of the speakers this morning. What I take back is of tremendous value. I mean, the library that a lady had, a lady that spoke on North Korea, uh, a gentleman that spoke about Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, these are information, knowledge that you take back. And I think what we share with each other are something that touches us. It, 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 no matter whether you're living in states or you're living in Nepal or you're living in Indonesia, we all have vision, aspiration to do good for people. And I think this is the kind of fraternity that we need to, at times when we're low, to encourage us, give a pat on the back, at times to share the wonderful stories that we have and take that story, spread it around, take the young people in and move them around. So I think that's, that's really what happens here. Yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there are many young people, but also not uh, so young, are invited now to make commentaries and to ask questions. Uh, uh, if you want to identify yourself, please stand up that I can see you because we are here bombarded by, by shining lights. Yes, please, maybe introduce yourself briefly. There will be a microphone. Yes. My name is Lee Schooland. Um, I think when we talk about Chinese investment in the world, we have to um, and identify it, what kind of investment. They're from the Chinese government or government-owned enterprises or private uh, business people. I think most of the investment made in uh, at least 
in Africa and Asia countries are from Chinese government or Chinese government owned enterprises. That's why the interest is so low because it's taxpayers' money. They, they're not there, not, they're there for making money, but that's not their first agenda. Their agenda is economic imperialism. And uh, the string attached is not visible, but it's there. Very obvious to us to, when we look at it. So do you have a breakdown, like uh, uh, some data, what's the percentage of the investment is from the Chinese government or the government-owned enterprises, and what is truly a uh, you know, free market uh, investment? Good question. Uh, you're right. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen between government to government. Uh, but what we focus as South Chamber is to work with the private sectors of China. Uh, our partners in China is an institution called CCPIT. Uh, they're based with a lot of private sector people. Uh, there is a lot of wealth in China. There's a lot of, again, like what you said is true, is what the governments do is something that we have very little control on. But the control that we have is to bring in business. Let me just put it this way. In Maldives, 60% of the tourists that come are Chinese. Now, that's good business, as far as I'm concerned. We would like to encourage more Chinese coming up, visiting our part of the world, helping our economy to move forward. And we encourage that kind of exchange in culture, in, in exchange in business. A lot of uh, business coming to Nepal, for example, there's a lot of Chinese restaurants coming in. Why? Because there's a lot of Chinese tourists coming in. So I tend to agree with you that we need to be careful when it goes to government to government, where we have very little control on, but what we definitely encourage is people-to-people -people contact because I think there are a lot of good business people in China who are looking for investment out of China also. Yeah? So um, I won't be able to answer your first question on the government part of it, which I know what you're saying, uh, and we, we, we see that happening also. But private sector, we encourage that. Okay. Uh, I see no hand at this moment. I cannot believe it. Yes, please. Yes. You can also give a commentary. I mean, uh, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, thank you for that uh, signage. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, thank please. You. Yes. Thank you very much for your comments this, uh, this morning. My name is Anirudh, and uh, I'm from the Greater Mekong Research Center in Cambodia. And I would like to ask you about your thoughts on the reality and potential of trade between SARC and Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. Thank you. I think uh, there has been a genuine sort of uh, move forward on that with BIMSTEAK, which uh, goes beyond South Asia. Can you tell us what is yeah. BIMSTEAK? BIMSTEAK is now getting Thailand and Myanmar and uh, other countries involved. And I think the concept is to try and have a free trade between South Asia and East Asia uh, to a part of it. And uh, there has been a lot of uh, work that's happening. In fact, there was a recent meeting that took place with Asian Development Bank and all the heads of governments uh, from finance ministry and the private sector, which is looking at how we can take that trade beyond Myanmar, coming to Thailand, and moving on to Laos and Cambodia. So there are discussions. But me, on a personal level, uh, I used to head the Tourism Council of South Asia. And I've taken the Mekong as a success story on harnessing the, 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 the cultural values in that area and to encourage tourism. So I think uh, we're learning a lot from what's happening up there also as stories that we, we share with each other. I think it is Mr. Danu, if I see correct, yes, yeah. from India, please, sir. Uh, I'm Danu Raj from Center for Public Policy Research, India. Uh, I was reminded by this very cute picture that was there when Prime Minister Modi took the ceremonial oath as Prime Minister of India when all the heads of state of South Asia region were, were present. But being from India, you know, we have this parochial approach of being the big brother in the region, being the, the, the growth engine of the re, for the region. Uh, I do doubt you know, the, the approach by the other uh, South Asian countries towards India, and then to counter India's dominance, you, you know, you be with uh, Chinese uh, uh, investment uh, opportunities uh, there in different uh, countries in South Asia region. I was wondering, uh, you know, China is trying to promote two banks uh, to promote investments and uh, loans, 
At the same time, you have, we have the regional disparity in terms of, uh, let's say, um, angel funding or uh, uh, pro bono investment opportunities provided by the, the private market. So how do, you, how do you look at, as a president of uh, South Asian Ch Chamber of Commerce president, you know, how do you look at these emerging trends? And uh, I remember uh, Prime Minister Modi had this big ambition to gift a satellite for the South Asian countries. So there are initiatives, but at the same time, I know everybody looks at India as a big brother, and you know you have some imperialist, uh, you know, you know the tendencies shown. And uh, I'm sure the different politicians take uh, these issues in different manner. But uh, as a as a private entity, how do you look at them? You know, the issue is the big big brother. Uh, you know, when a big brother hugs you out of love, it's a big hug, huh? takes your breath away at times. So the thing that we say is India needs to be the big sister. And we all look at India as the engine of growth and the engine that will drive us forward. And there's no dispute on that. India is extremely important for us. And we think India's example on values that you create for yourself are examples for all of us in all eight countries. So the first thing would be is um, to take that lighter step and not say that China is a counter to India. It's never been that way. My wife is Indian, all right? And at times I'm accused of supporting the Chinese investment. No, it's really not that. The reality is India is looking for investment itself at this moment, at this moment. And India is lobbying very strongly to bring investment to India so it can create jobs and do whatever it needs to do. So uh, I think the fear of the Chinese influence in our part of the world would be real if we don't talk to each other. When I go to India, I hear of this huge project coming up in, 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 in Pakistan, which is called the CPEC, which is this massive investment on infrastructure. I'm sure there's a danger in, in, in politics which could destabilize the entire region to some extent. Or the Chinese investment going to Sri Lanka in these huge ports, that could be a threat in terms of security to South Asia. But by no means do the private sector and the people of South Asia encourage China to use South Asia as a strategic location. But for that to happen, we need to sit across the table and say, what are our problems? And this is what we say, SARC is important. A lot of people say SARC is a failure. If India and Pakistan don't talk to each other, the influence of China will just get stronger. It doesn't help. It does not help by not talking. And I think this is why SARC is important. We cannot cancel summits. Summits are not a place that you agree on things. You agree on 25%, on 75% you disagree, and then you say, we will discuss on the issues that we don't agree upon, and then find solutions for that. But if you say, I will not talk to each other, what does that do? The influence just gets stronger. So I need to make this very, very clear. India is an extremely important part of South Asia, because you are the largest population, you are the biggest economy, we have common language, common things that happens with each other. But if we don't talk to each other at the same table, then I think we will have a problem in long term. So I think there needs to be a greater understanding on how we, 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 we move this process forward. So I think, uh, you know, really to answer your question is, um, I know, I was in China recently, and in spite of everything that happens on the media front where India and China is projected to not even talk to each other, uh, with Modiji's last visit on breaks to China, I know there are about seven co uh, companies from China, private companies from China, coming to cities of Gujarat, uh, Pune, and Mumbai to help some of these people work on smart cities. Now, there is discussion happening at that level. So I would think the Chinese influence on South Asia is absolutely misunderstood when it's brought to the context that we're leveraging India's problem. No, it really, look, we eat the same food. We have the same, shut your eyes, listen to that music, you won't know whether it's from Afghanistan, Pakistan, or India. It's the same. You said we eat the same food. That reminds me that the lunch break lunch is dinner. coming up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before we break, I was just given a signal for two more minutes. Uh, so I have a little present for you here. 
and uh, I, with the tolerance also of the organizer, uh, I would like you to open it. Uh, because there's a message in this which is relevant to all of our participants. I know in all, not all parts of Asia it's considered polite to open presents in front of those who bring the <laughs> presents, but please do this. There's an exception to this. Yes, Absolutely. thank you, sir. Yes. <laughs> now, we all believe in the equality of opportunity. And uh, this said, this is, of course, a personal present from the Naumann Foundation Delhi office to our dear speaker. But uh, I have brought three of these presents. And uh, now, how will I distribute them in the sense of uh, equality of opportunity? I thought of the following. If you like what he has, you can receive it. OK, what does it say on it? It's always time for freedom. Okay, I think, yes. So, there's always, it's always time for freedom. Certainly, this is a slogan we can all agree on. And if you want this watch, you have a clock. It's, it's kind of too big for a watch. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that doesn't look nice, actually. You can walk around with this. Yeah. So, if you want this clock, please send a tweet uh, to FNF South Asia, or at FNF South Asia. Uh, or tweet it and just uh, with the hashtag being freedom clock. So hashtag freedom clock at FNF South Asia and the first three senders will uh, receive this clock. Here is my colleague Nupur who is sitting on the clocks. Yes, not sitting <laughs> on them but who is uh, uh, taking care of them. And should you not have a Twitter account and should you really want a clock then you may approach me ladies and gentlemen and I will see what I can do for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say that I really enjoy talking to you. Uh, I'm pleased uh, that uh, we are finishing on time and I would really like to thank you all for your attention and also for your active participation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, as I have mentioned before, uh, there will be a crowdsource liberty session uh, where around 20 project leaders are looking for you guys to help them out develop their projects. To explain how it will work, I'd like to introduce Manali Shah, who has moderated the fundraising training workshop right before this forum. She is also an independent training facilitator, helping think tanks all over the world align their strategies to their values and missions. Manali has also worked for, at the Center for Civil Society and the Frederick Naumann Foundation in India. Uh, please welcome Manali Shah. So, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello. Well, I'm a moderator, so you know, this is, uh, I have to get all of you focused and excited to listen to what I have to say. Uh, usually after lunch, I understand people like to move and not come back to sit on their seats. Uh, so, this is what we have planned for you today. So after the lunch session, we have the crowdsource liberty session. And I must tell you, the last two and a half days, we've spent with 17 organization leaders from across Asia and, uh, uh, and also from New Zealand and US. And it was so inspiring to hear all the good work they want to do. And we talked about how to get funding and how to get resources. But more than that, they need help to develop their ideas further. They need someone to come and question them, to suggest uh, who else has done the similar work they want to do. Uh, they need someone to come and just give them a pat on the back and say, hey, good work. Uh, so that's what we would like to create the opportunity for. Uh, Crowdsource Liberty is one of the signature events at the regional Liberty Forums. It's the favorite part that I love. Uh, so how it would work is you already saw the boards that were lined up as you walked in for registration. Those boards have been moved near the lunch area at the back. So as you are having lunch, uh, you can walk around and again read uh, what projects and organization challenges uh, these people have posted. Um, and then at 2 o'clock sharp, you'll find one person near every board. Uh, this is the person who's the project leader or the organization representative. And this person will be standing there, and you're welcome to walk around, uh, engage with them in a conversation. And as I said, ask questions, give an idea, suggest a connection, 
or just give a pat on the back. Uh, but uh, do take your chance. It's a great way for you to learn uh, what other great work is happening in the region. And it's a great opportunity for them to get ideas from many people in the room. Uh, Tarun and I uh, will be available to help you if you need uh, have any questions. But from 2 and 3, spontaneous order comes alive. And we hope that many of you will go back to the boards and engage in really exciting conversations. And how do we know this session is successful? Well, Atlas does follow up with all the people who have put up their posters. And we want to see in six months' time, at least some of those ideas come alive. And they have in the past. So this, really, this session really works. We need your support. And please make a personal goal. So at least try to go to five boards and give five ideas. Yeah? So enjoy. Thank you.